Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. My name is Megan Donaldson, and I'm a Global Alumni Relations Officer here at Trinity Development and Alumni. Today, we're delighted to welcome Professor Roseanne Kenny, Chair of Medical Gerontology at Trinity College Dublin. She'll be sharing insights on ageism during COVID-19 and the opportunities and possibilities that have arisen during this global health crisis for a better, more inclusive future for changes in attitudes towards older people. Now, a lot of you at this point are probably experts on Zoom, but for those who are new to the technology, I'm just gonna run through a few uh, technical items here for you. If you're joining us on Zoom and would like to view this webinar in full screen, you can do so using the button in the top right-hand corner. If you need to adjust your audio settings, you can do so using the button in the bottom left corner. If you need to leave the session for any reason, you can do so using the button in the bottom right corner. We do very much encourage you to ask questions during the presentation, and you can do so and submit them by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Our speaker will respond to these later in the webinar. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar, we will be recording it and we'll post it to our YouTube channel after this, uh, so you can watch it at a later time. For those of you who are joining us on YouTube Live, if you need to mute or unmute the video, you can do so using the small red speaker button. Uh, to share the webinar, you can click on the share button down on the right. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, please click the red button. And as I mentioned, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, you can submit them in the comments section here and we will share them with our speaker. Uh, the talk will last about 40 minutes and uh, followed by some time for Q&A at the end. So we'll take just about an hour and wrap up shortly before 5 p.m. Irish time. So to introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Professor Roseanne Kenny holds the chair of medical gerontology and is head of the academic department of medical gerontology at Trinity. She is director of a new state-of-the-art clinical research institute for aging at St. James's Hospital, known as MISA, and is the founding principal investigator of Ireland's largest adult population study on the experience of aging in Ireland, uh, which is called the Irish Longitudinal, Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, or TILDA, and it's now in its 12th year. In 2019, she, uh, she co-chaired the SAPEA EU Commission report, Transforming the Future of Aging in Europe, and has co-authored over 500 scientific publications and received many awards for her work. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Kenny. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and hello everybody. Uh, we have almost 200 people joined, so that's wonderful uh, for uh, participation. So the quest for eternal youth has plagued mankind for as long as we can trace. The Tang Dynasty represents the most prosperous period of Chinese history from 618 to 1900 AD. And yet, despite the level of sophistication in the civil service and sophistication in their culture of that time, six of 22 emperors died from accidental self-poisoning. In the quest for eternal youth, the alchemists at the time would prepare concoctions guaranteed to provide immortality, which included sulfur, mercury, gold, and red blood cinnabar, highly toxic compounds. We still are pursuing this quest for eternal youth. This just shows one of those Tang uh, emperors who succumbed. And this is very relevant to today, where some of our leaders, or a leader, has recommended the imbibing substances such as disinfectant to get rid of this uh, terrible pandemic which we're all experiencing at the moment. This is what the alchemists recommended to the emperors. After taking the elixir, if your face and body itch, insects are crawling all over you, your hands and feet swell dropsically, you can't stand the smell of food, you feel as though you're going to be sick, you experience weakness in your limbs, etc., etc. It's working. 
All of these are proof that the elixir you are taking is successfully dispelling your latent disorders, your age-related disorders. Well, of course, we know that's not true, and these are all the side effects of those, of those toxins. So fast forward to now, and what we know about our average life expectancy over the last 200 years. These are records from countries, or these are data from countries which have kept very good records of uh, lifespan. And we can see here that since the 1800s, over the last 200 years, there has been a doubling almost in most developed countries in life expectancy. You know, this is phenomenal. And you'll have heard said time and time again, this is a wonderful achievement for society today. What it actually translates to is that the proportion of the population age 60 and older, which is are currently, uh, this is the distribution, so zero to 9% in African countries, for example, 10 to 19% are over 60 in some of these other countries here and continents, 20 to 24%. 25 to 29% ourselves, and 30 or more, of course, Japan. In the next 25 to 30 years, this is what we can expect, that the proportion of the population over 60 will increase significantly in many, many countries worldwide. And 30% or more over that age group is represented in the darker colors here. So this is a huge change, a huge global demographic shift. And of course, the question is, are we ready? Are we prepared? And what do we need to do for preparedness? The longest lived countries, Japan, of course, Switzerland, Singapore, these ones kind of jockey for, for first uh, place with the exception of Japan pretty much for the last 10 years. Ireland are 19th. Our life expectancy for both sexes is almost 82 years now. Female 83, 84 and male 79, 80. So the, the question is, why are we aging and what can we do about aging? And can, what can we ourselves control to modify the aging process? And for answers, we turn to long lived animals. And this is a good example, the Antarctic sponge. So this is an immobile creature, very slow growth rate. Um, which the oldest known one of which is 1,500 years old. I mean, that's remarkable. This is the longest lived mammal, the bowhead whale, over 200 years. And the eternal youth jellyfish probably does have eternal youth because it morphs from polyp to adult and back to polyp again. So to the best of our knowledge has no natural limit to lifespan. So what's driving that remarkable longevity in just a few examples I've given you of those animals and can we translate that to humans? So fast forward from the Tang dynasty now to the naked mole rat, not a terribly attractive very small rat. And this is the subject of research in a new group, which is a subsidiary of Google, um, established in 2013 called Calico. The company is called Calico. And uh, the, the, the CEO of uh, Google, Larry Page, founded this, stating at the time that tackling aging is one of life's, is incredibly important to the company, given that aging is one of life's greatest mysteries. And Calico has invested heavily in research in many strands of aging, but one of them is this uh, naked mole rat. And the reason being that this small, hairless, blind creature lives to 30 years and doesn't get the diseases we traditionally uh, associate with aging, like cancers, like heart disease. The female has no menopause, etc. And remarkably, 
it, it, it lives, it's predominant, predominantly in East Africa. It burrows holes in the ground, tunnels down, which is why it's got two long protruding mobile front teeth. And it can live for, without any death in brain cells for about 20 minutes in, a, in an atmosphere with no oxygen. Compare that to our brains, human brains. Our cells start to die after 60 seconds of deprivation of oxygen. And, and it is oxygen deprivation of longer than three minutes is irreversible from the perspective of cells. So this is really interesting and uh, understanding from the, from the, the cellular prospect why this animal is so long lived without these age related diseases is the focus of a lot of the research within that calico group. And we know from their research and that of many others that the fundamental issue with respect to aging is, is understanding what happens at a cellular level between production of energy by cells and getting rid of the toxins that are as a result of that energy production. What do I mean by that? So the, the nucleus of the cell is, if you like, the library. It's where DNA is, is retained in the cell. And the DNA is, of course, our genes, and that drives everything the cell does. So it's important to understand the nucleus, to know about the nucleus and the other and component of the cell that is critical in the context of aging in cells is the mitochondria. That's the powerhouse where all of the energy sits within the cell. So the library, which holds the DNA, sends messages, instructions to the mitochondria to produce energy. And that energy is used to make new cells, to make the heartbeat, to lower blood pressure, to get peristalsis going through the gut, to make urine uh, function, etc. But the production of energy necessary for all of those different components of our body's activity necessarily results in the accumulation of toxins. And a good functioning cell produces lots of energy from the food that's taken in and the instructions from the nucleus, but also gets rid of all of those toxins really quickly. What happens with aging is we get a slowing in that process. Now, you'll hear people saying, oh, it's, it's all about genetics. The, the, the bottom line is it is not all about genetics. We actually have control as a society and as individuals of 70 to 80% of the aging processes in, in cells. Genetics only kicks in after the age of 80. I've often had patients, 75 year old, smoking, drinking excessively, obese. And when, I, when one tries to give advice with respect to those lifestyle behaviors, patient might respond, I don't need to worry. My mother lived to 90 and my father to 92. I've got good genes. Well, actually the genes which determine aging only kick in after the age of 80. So that is so if you come from a long lived family and you make it to 80. But up until the age of 80, it's about the environmental or extrinsic factors which influence aging. And there's a host of those cited. The accumulation of toxins we've discussed, the, um, the uh, programming of aging, you know, elephants live 70 years, we live 80, 82 years. Uh, the mayfly lives five for five minutes, shrew, 12 months. So, so we pretty much, each of the different animals actually pretty much have a defined lifespan as I speak. However, um, it's not just about programmed aging. We know that cross protein cross-linking is another reason that the proteins within cells cross-link. And we see this in some lung diseases where fibrotic structures uh, start to develop with advancing age in thickening of blood vessels, at, at aging skin, etc. Um, inflammaging. Now, probably all of these trigger inflammaging, and inflammaging is an inflammatory process in the cell, and it's really critical to immunity, which I'm going to come on to next. And then free radical theory, and of course, the uh, supplement companies have jumped onto this, that antioxidants reduce free radicals, which are part of the toxic accumulation in cells and that reduction of free radicals slows down the process of aging. The truth of the matter is it's probably a combination of all of these 
theories of aging. So when does it start? It, it starts early. This is a really nice study from Dunedin uh, group who are also doing longitudinal studies, but they've taken a, a different approach. Our longitudinal study looks at a representative cohort in Ireland aged 50 and over. In the Dunedin study, they've followed a thousand participants from birth. And you follow the same people every two to four years, very same model as the TILDA study. And this is the results of biological aging, that cell aging I was talking about, in all of their participants when they were aged 38. So everybody's aged 38, that's the chronological age. But then we were, they were able to look at epigenetic features, which are measures, sort of clocks within the cell, which can measure the biological aging of the cell, all of those different parameters I was talking about the biological aging of the cell. And look at the spread in biological age, even at the age of 38. Some were performing aged 38, like 26 year olds. Some were performing all, almost from a biological perspective, like 50 year olds. So that much of a 20 year spread difference in biological aging and the factors which drove those differences were socioeconomic status, particularly, particularly, um, as evidenced by education levels, poverty in childhood, bad health behaviors early, like smoking, drinking, drugs at an early stage, pr mood problems, depression, anxiety, etc. So adverse childhood events. And the thing is that the cell changes that were measured, the biological cell changes actually were shared by every single system in the body. It wasn't just that these adverse childhood events, which were driving early biological aging, were actually just affecting the cardiovascular system, or thyroid disorders, et cetera. No, all physiological systems were influenced by these adverse changes. And this also, underscores how important socioeconomic status and education is to lifespan. And this is data from the EU 28 between 2007 and 2016. Life expectancy for people over that period of time with level zero to two education, that's primary level education, secondary level education and tertiary level education. So the majority of people listening today fall into that category, but you almost have a nine to 10 years difference in lifespan in the cohort listening compared to those who have not attained secondary level education. So this is something at a societal level that we should be addressing across the board in Europe and beyond. And you know, the heterogeneity that I showed you in, in the young Dunedin study, the 38 year olds, we saw this, we see the same thing in, in the Tilda study. This is speed of walking. Believe it or not, speed of walking is a really good indicator of pace of aging, how fast you're aging. So this is walk at your normal speed. That's the test over a fixed uh, length of, of corridor and turn around and come back again. So that, that's a very simple test. So. The, the age of our participants is here, almost 9,000 participants, and this is speed. At age 50, you can see that there isn't a lot of variation in speed. Most people are, are, are walking between six and just over 10 um, uh, seconds to, to achieve over, over that fixed distance. But as people get older, there's more of a spread in how quickly uh, that walking distance can be achieved. However, what I want you to, to take from this is there are people aged 85 in our TILDA cohort who are performing just as well as 50 year olds. So we see this heterogeneity right throughout the lifespan. What's that, all, what's that got to do with immunity? Immunity declines with aging and all of the factors that we've rehearsed with respect to triggers for aging within cells are associated with immune response. So, so what, 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 are the, what, are, what are the lessons that we can take from our knowledge about cell aging? And of course, you'll know that the most serious consequences of COVID infection occur in older age groups predominantly. 
what are the factors that we can learn from and apply to our management of COVID-19 from a policy perspective and an individual perspective. And I, that's just reinforcing what I've said that all of these factors are related to in the immune response and impairment in the immune response with aging. So what I mean by the immune system is the body's defense against foreign or dangerous invaders, be they you know, cancer cells, be they bacteria, viruses, of course, and we'll focus on viruses now. There are lots of cells involved in targeting infection, fighting against infection from the immediate insult of infection to the longer term management of infection and recognition of antigens and recognition of antigens through vaccination, etc. But all of those processes are slowed or impaired with advancing age. And to give you some sense of how much the response to influenza vaccination is not is, is effective in 90% of young adults, but only around 50% of older adults who receive vaccination. So that's quite a big discrepancy. And um, these are the factors that, extrinsic factors or environmental factors that influence those cellular age-related processes and enhance immune responsiveness. And there's good data for, for, for what I've just said for each of these different components. Friendship, laughter, having a purpose in life, downtime de-stressing, good diet, exercise, sleep, cold water. And now I'm just going to address each of these and explain that relationship. And it all, it all evolves around stress. All of these are related to stress. Either stress within the cell, which triggers those reactions we talked about, or psychological stress, which triggers stress hormone release, which also influence what's happening at a cellular level. Now, stress is good in the acute scenario, the flight or fight scenario. We've, we've evolved to have this intrinsic behavior, which is a good thing. When it's not good is when it triggers through stress hormones or other pathways, a chronic background grumbling inflammatory process. And that's bad for our systems and that accelerates aging, including impairing immune responses to infections. It's, it's almost unbelievable the influence that good social engagement and friendship has in the context of immune responses and healthy aging. It's as powerful at a cellular stress level in, in preventing, for example, death from heart disease as cigarette smoking and exercise and management of cholesterol. That's how important social engagement and friendship is. And this is work that's been done by the University of California and also similar work by colleagues in Harvard where they biopsied lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are the engines for inflammation. You'll be familiar with your lymph nodes becoming inflamed and palpable if you have a sore throat, etc. So they biopsied lymph nodes from macaque monkeys who were friendless who had been expo not, not exposed to friends, et cetera, for a period of time and found high activity in inflammatory genes. Remember about background inflammation and how bad that is for immunity and low activity in the genes which prevent against viruses. And another group in Harvard have shown that poor social contacts and poor quality of friendship in humans is associated with higher levels of circulating fibrinogen and fibrinogen causes clotting, causes uh, atherosclerotic vessels to clot, to obstruct and causes as a consequence stroke and heart disease. So this is just an example of how friendship at a cellular level can influence uh, outcomes. The other, the other factor which has a big influence on immune systems is laughter. Laughter reduces stress hormones and therefore decelerates the cellular 
aging process at a cellular level. Having a purpose. Now, this was first identified some, some years ago by the groups who, who, who studied centenarians in areas, there are blue zones, they're called worldwide, where there's a, dis, a high proportion of the population live to 100 or beyond, and don't just live to 100 or beyond, live fit and well to 100 or beyond. And one of the factors which drove longevity in those cohorts was knowing why you wake up in the morning, having a purpose in life. And they found that having a purpose in life, but in each day added seven years of extra life expectancy. This is a whole lecture in itself, how important having a purpose is and how in some people's cases, retirement can negatively influence the sense of having purpose. But there are ways that as an individual and as a society, we can accommodate that. One of the things that COVID for me certainly has exposed is our ageist society. And these are just some uh, cuttings from newspaper articles that we put together. My older generation is privileged and selfish, Max Hastings. Texas Lieutenant Governor suggests grandparents are willing to die for US economy. I presume with the exception of the president. Council issues tips for elderly in exercise. Oh, as we get older, we hate the use of the term elderly and it's been admonished in many scenarios, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be used. Convincing baby, baby boomer parents to take the coronavirus seriously. And this is one of the earlier ones and probably one of the most uh, ageist that I've come across by Jeremy uh, Warner. Does the Fed know something the rest of us don't know and it's panicking to cut interest rates? And he posited that not to put too fine a point on it from an entirely disinterested economic perspective, this was written in text in his article, the COVID-19 might even prove mildly beneficial in the long term by disproportionately culling elderly dependents. So it's very difficult to have a positive attitude uh, as, as we get older and to have purpose and to have laughter and to have engagement if you've got these negative exterior factors constantly gnawing and chewing at you as an individual. Exercise, of course, is really important. Exercise is really important for the immune system. But my, my message to you today is you all know about aerobic exercise, but resistant exercise programs are particularly important as people get older for, for immunity and for, for all age-related disorders. We're not adhering to the um, exercise guidelines. Only 30% over the age of 50 adhere to the minimum guidelines for cardiovascular health, which is five days of 30 minute brisk walking. Only one third of us are doing that. And only 8% are doing resistance exercise uh, programs two to three times a week. Th this is really important because sarcopenia, which is a reduction in muscle strength and mass becomes quite common after the age of 40 and ultimately will lead to frailty syndromes. So resistant exercise programs are critical as people get older. This was a nice statistics from Public Health England, where they studied the time people spent on the toilet compared to the time spent adhering to these guidelines of brisk walking for 150 minutes a week. And people spend twice as much time, this was a re representative sample of English people, spent twice as much time on the toilet as doing exercise. I mentioned sarcopenia, loss of muscle strength and loss of muscle mass, and there has been a good recent randomized control trial showing that protein supplements reduce the prevalence of sarcopenia in people over the age of 60. Now we think of protein supplements being taken by young uh, muscular men in gyms, but actually the, this, this study underscores the importance of protein supplements, particularly the essential amino acid leucine and to a lesser extent valine and isoleucine coupled with vitamin D. This is, these are one of the few studies on supplements which have shown positive outcome long-term. 
I want to uh, under, uh, just bring to your attention this uh, really excellent book on walking by a colleague of ours in Trinity, Shane O'Mara. It's got uh, great reviews. Uh, it, it, it really takes us through why we walk, how we've evolved to walk and how important walking is, not just as an exercise, but also as exposure to our environment. And of course, the COVID-19 restrictions have restricted all that I just previously described as being of benefit to the aging process and at a cellular level and to our immune responses, unfortunately. Now, a couple of other things that, that are, are useful for uh, improving our ability to respond from an immune, immune perspective is downtime. It's well recognized for, for, for a long time that stress isn't good for the system and there's really good objective data to support the negative impact of stress on immune responses. Of course, it's part of life. I've said that the, our, our, the, the fight and flight response is, is an inherent, normal, evolved response, which, which, which is good for us. But the important thing is when, when the stress hormones and the stress responses rise acutely, they should come back to normal. But mood, depression, anxiety, stress, all trigger a chronic inflammatory background response. So blue zone peoples, all have de-stressing, uh, relieving rituals built into their daily routines, which obfuscate these cellular changes and enhance their longevity. For example, the Adventists in Southern California pray. The Carians take a nap. And my preferred choice is the Sardinian one. They do happy hour. So they do happy hour together. It's distressing because again, there's good objective scientific evidence that a problem shared is a problem halved. When you've said it, when you've shared it with people, it reduces the stress associated with whatever is troubling you. They have laughter, they have friendship as a consequence and they're getting their uh, nutrition through wine and we'll come on in a moment to how that is beneficial. Other me mechanisms for de-stressing are meditation, breathing exercises, muscle relaxation exercises, and of course, yoga. And yoga acts duly by, uh, through exercise pathways and also through de-stressing psychological pathways and meditation. The foods, I mean, again, this is just such a, such a, a huge, dense area, but bottom line is plant slant. And the two diets that are the cornerstone of most centenarian populations, which have high prevalence of centenarians, are the Mediterranean diet and the Blue Zone diet. And they share a whole lot in common, but critically, virtually no sugar. No unintentional sugar, virtually no salt, low and refined grains, loads of nuts and fruits and pulses and beans, small amounts of whole grains, lots of veg, and of course, fish. And if meat is taken, it's done, so it's done uh, again purposefully, red meat in the blue zones about twice a month in small amounts. Now, again, in the context of diet, there is good evidence that caloric restriction improves longevity in loads of animal species. I mean, this, I just want to share this example of rhesus monkeys with you. These two monkeys um, are the same age. They're both 20 years old, but one has been on a restrict, calorie restricted diet, 40% uh, of the normal dietary intake less than, it's, uh, uh, that, than the other uh, control groups. So th that's the monkey on the calorie restricted diet. And this monkey is the same age on a standard diet. And you can see that this monkey for lots of reasons looks a lot older. It's got less hair, less fatty tissues in the face, eyes are more sunken, etc. 
And that's then from the side, this is the calorie restricted monkey. And this is the, sorry, this is the calorie restricted monkey. And this is the normal diet monkey. Now, we, in the monkeys, we do know that calorie restriction um, prevents age-related diseases such as diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. And these are just some examples, and there's lots out there, of diets that calorie-restricted diets that have we, we don't know about extending longevity as yet, but we do know that they positively influence, again, those cellular mechanisms I talked about earlier on. Um, this, is, this is our normal, typical eating pattern where we have three meals a day, glucose goes up and down and up and down and up and down, and suffice to say, that's not good. And this is between 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. No change in ketones. Whereas here, say in, in B, we have a one day fast, alternate days, and you can see glucose stays flat during the day of fasting, of course, and ketones gradually begin to rise. And then when meals start again, drop. And here we've got the 18 hour fast. This is one of the most popular ones. And it might, you might think, God, 18 hours, how can you do 18 hours fast? Actually, if you confine your eating period to eight hours, and then say, have your last meal at 6 p.m., then 18 hours after that, later on the following morning, you have a late breakfast or a brunch at, at midday. That's the 18 hour fast. Calorie restricting mimics are also developed, have been studied and are, are being studied. And we know that they all have beneficial influences on the immune system, particularly the SIRT1 gene, which, which, which influences our immune responses. And they're mostly polyphenols and drugs which influence the mTOR pathway. So resveratrol and quercetin influence poly, or polyphenols and uh, rapamycin and fecetin influence mTOR pathways. Metformin, which is a diabetic drug, uh, oral uh, drug used for type 2 diabetes. It was noted in very large population studies that people with diabetes taking metformin were living longer than diabetics taking other diabetic drugs and all factors, uh, confounders con controlled for. And the, the sort of foods which are high in these calorie restriction mimics are red grapes, peanuts, prunes, blueberries, cranberries, dark, dark fruit, and nuts and herbs. And there, there is a long list of those if you, if you uh, want to follow up on that further. I just want to say I'm very passionate about vitamin D, that deficiency is really common. It's common in Ireland. Half of people over 80 are deficient in vitamin D. We get it from three sources, from sunshine, from food and from supplements, it's very difficult to get enough from food. And we don't get enough of sunshine in Ireland, certainly not from September, in other words, autumn and winter time. So, so we recommend taking vitamin D and there's good evidence now that it is reduces bacterial and viral infections in children, and there is one randomized control trial which has shown a reduction, a significant reduction in adults. So it seems to work in preventing infections, and at a cellular level, there's a host of data supporting its benefit in modifying immune responses. And this is just much too busy a slide, but I wanted to show it to you to make this point. It stops the uh, what we know now is the ACE2 mediated pathway, which triggers the cytokine flush, including bradykinin, that we see in COVID. If you like, ACE2 is the door handle into the cell, which allows the virus in and actually also manipulates um, other ACE2 receptors once the virus is in to, to influence further virus getting into the cell and leakage of fluids from the cells. So, so the ACE2 receptors are in the lungs, intestine, kidneys and hearts, organs, which are all involved in, in COVID. And, and certainly there's really strong circumstantial evidence that vitamin D helps to block this cascade. 
There's no harm in taking vitamin D in doses less than 4,000 international units a day. So at the moment, I would say to, to the audience, consider taking vitamin D up to 1,000 international units, that's 25 micrograms a day, year round, unless you get a lot of sunshine exposure. And even if you do, it, 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 there's no harm, it, there's no adverse event, effects from this virtually at all. So we're working with Public Health England to get recommendations around that. And finally, sleep is important for immune responses. Lots of things happen when we're asleep. You know, it used to be thought that sleep was a time when we stopped, when the body stopped, when the brain stopped. In fact, it's incredibly active. And it's active in, in terms of flushing out toxins from the system and revitalizing our immune systems. And it actually, it actually um, during sleep, we release cytokines, which have an immune, a beneficial immune set system response. And, and also it allows T cells to revitalize and a sticky agent called integrin to be released uh, during, during non-REM sleep, deep sleep, which is important for recognition of viral antigens. Finally, cold water. Have a cold shower every morning. Have a hot shower first and get ready, and then just have a cold shower blast. And of course, there, there, is, there, is, there is good evidence that work, that, that um, absenteeism from work, that the number of chest infections and the number of antibiotics one needs in a year are significantly reduced in randomized control studies in people who cold water swim of all ages. So finally, uh, COVID-19 has particularly affected older people. And this was an article from last week's New England Journal of Medicine. And it focuses on the fact that billions of dollars are flowing at the moment into research and development efforts to particularly to develop vaccines and, and drug treatments for COVID-19. But it highlights the insufficient research in immunity in older persons and, and the fact that we're navigating partially blindly until we understand much more about the mechanisms of immunity uh, in, in the context of developing vaccinations and preventative therapies for, for COVID for older people until we understand this much better. We're, we're looking at this in Trinity um, and we've been resourced to look at antibody levels in, in the TILDA series people's experience of, of COVID in Ireland. And we have very good biomarker measures now, just like I showed you in the Dunedin study, epigenetic markers, so that we can actually track in those who had antibodies and a, and a bad COVID experience, or those who had anti have antibodies and a, you know, hardly had any uh, evidence of disease. What are the early biomarkers which predict that? And then what are the risk factors that we know can modify those, et cetera, to better inform how we can prevent serious consequences. So in summary, these are the external environmental factors that we ourselves can control, which are beneficial to the immune systems in the context of aging. And I would like to thank our funders, our research funders, uh, particularly the Atlantic Philanthropies um, who, uh, together with the foundation, uh, have, have been a great source of funding and support for aging research in Trinity, the Department of Health, the Health Research Board, and Irish Life gave us, 13 years ago, a substantive philanthropic gift to get the TILDA study started. And I would like to acknowledge them and then all of the other uh, research bodies who fund us. Thank you to the alumni team and thank you to our aging research teams in Trinity and in Mercer's Institute at St. James's Hospital. Thank you. So we have a lot, a lot of questions here. Um, is vitamin D supplementation is one of the first ones. Uh, Megan, shall I, shall I answer that one? Yeah, shall I go with go right ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, is vitamin D supplementation of any help in resisting the virus? I think I've answered that now. Now, there are only, there's one good randomized control trial which showed that uh, people with 
normal or high normal vitamin D levels were much less likely, significantly less likely to be admitted to intensive care units with COVID. Um, there are ongoing studies. They're difficult because you can't randomize people. So, so but the, 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 certainly the circumstantial evidence is very, very strong. Um, should those supporting older people concentrate on engaging with them in an unrushed way suitably distanced rather than just delivering their shopping. Oh, thank you for raising that. This is, comes from Gabriel Brocklesby. Thank you so much, Gabriel. That's such an important, important point. We have to come up with other ways of engaging during this. We could have this for some period of time, but even if we don't, you know, what's happening in nursing homes is, is heartbreaking. Um, the fact that the average life expectancy in a nursing home is 2.5 to 3.5 years in Ireland. And the fact that now maybe six months of that period of time has been spent with, in some cases, with an almost total isolation in a room. And when healthcare staff with PPE come into the room, you can't, it's really difficult to hear what you're saying. I find this all the time in ward rounds. It's so stark very hard for people as they get older to hear what you're saying. They can only see your eyes. There's nothing else familiar. It's, it's a terrible scenario. So I would like that, to think that we had other solutions. And I would encourage, you know, uh, you know you, sensible engagement, but certainly engagement. I think I've shown you how important it is. From Tanya Moore, any thoughts on mindset, optimistic mindset impact on healthy aging? and belief systems. Okay, so, so that's, that's great. Okay, so I didn't cover all of this. Actually, I've just finished the first draft of a book which covers all of these, I'm calling it the nine secrets of successful aging. And I take each of those in a different chapter. And, and indeed, there's great, there's great data behind being positive. And we've shown even in the, in the TILDA study, people who've got a positive attitude towards aging, age more slowly. And we've been able to adjust for lots of different confounders because you might say, well, they have a positive attitude towards aging because th there's less disability or they've less disorders or diagnosis. So adjusting for all of that, if you think you're young and able and have a positive attitude, you behave younger and more able. And actually you are as young as you feel. Um, and religion, uh, religion's interesting actually, it depends on which culture you look at. In Ireland, we did find that uh, people who practice religion at wave one, who were, who were regular church goers, were less likely to be depressed. But actually over the study period, over the 12 years, that relationship changed and it fell, it fell off being significant. And we think it was because of the church scandals that evolved in that interim period. And people who were regular church goers and, uh, you know, it was, it was more difficult for them actually. But certainly there's good evidence uh, that belief and meditation, et cetera, associated with some religious practices is really good for, for aging and for health. Um, so from Ross Hines in Dublin, um, one of the difficulties of aging, which I see is distinguishing between the things that are part of aging, which cannot be fixed, and those things which can be fixed. Is there a book to tell me <laughs> what issues I am likely to have as I grow older and how to recognize the ones that can be fixed? That's a really good point. And of course, the thing is, the earlier you recognize things, the m it's much easier to turn them around. So, so I, I mean, all, all, all of the things I've cited are actually things that, that we should start early. So, you know, thinking about retirement, start thinking at age 45, 50 about retirement, prepare yourself. Thinking about purpose, start early thinking about purpose. But you can make a purpose for every single day. And I haven't gone into the benefits of things like gardening and forests. There's a fantastic data on forests. In fact, the Japanese government have a whole research program on the benefits of what they call forest bathing on, on health for, for, all, for all age groups. So, so, you know, set a purpose for yourself as an individual every day. Don't get up knowing that, not knowing what the day is going to bring. That's the only way to do it. And I'll just give you one example of a 
patient I saw, 84 year old earlier in the week. Um, an amazing lady, she came in, I sat down, she was telling me how much she was missing her um, aerobic uh, um, water exercises, aqua exercises, which she w went to previously four times a week, how much she was missing bridge, which she also did four times a week. And she hated being restricted at the initial start of COVID restrictions and not being able to drive, going down to the shop, doing things for herself. And exactly what the previous questioner said, you know, people leaving a box at her door, which is very generous, but she said, I'd have loved if they'd come in for a cup of tea or coffee. I needed to talk to somebody. So that's that wonderful woman. And then I'll tell you what her medical condition was. She's got spinal stenosis. Now, she, this only came out during the conversation. You would not think this, talking to this vibrant, positively attituded woman. Um, and she's doubly incontinent of urine and feces, which she manages. Her gait, her walking, et cetera, is becoming slower. She's got urological problems in her legs and she knows she's gonna lose the power because the, the stenosis is inoperable in the next three to four months. So she's planning bringing her bed downstairs and actually getting modifications to her car so she can continue to drive, et cetera. So she really brought home to me how if I hadn't known her, if I wasn't a clinician and she hadn't shared her diagnosis, all I was seeing was a vibrant 84 year old. So how we view people and how, and our, our ageist approach to people really needs to be corrected as a society. Um, okay, how can we do friendship at the moment? Yeah, well, this is it. I mean, and particularly, you know, some people aren't that familiar with Zoom, et cetera, but I think, uh, okay. None of the recommendations were mandatory. I feel really strongly about this. So I think individuals have to use their own um, initiative and make individual choices about what they want to do. I feel very strongly that exposure to sunlight and physical activity is critical. And to do that with someone from another household will cover your friendship piece. You can sit outside and engage with someone um, outside. And I would say, you know, make sure you contact somebody every single day by phone, at least you ring them. So you're doing your bit for somebody else. Um, Rosanne, I think we have time for one last question. Okay, policy implications. Oh, it's it's gone. <laughs> it's just keeps. Okay, so when you say calorie restriction, is that compared to the recommended calorie intake? Y y yes, it is. Okay, fine. I'll end on this. Lovely rat experiments to show if you give one group of rats the same amount of food as another group of rats, but the difference is. This group are getting it over an eight hour period and this group are getting it over 24 hours. The 24 hour group get fat, obese. The eight hour group don't. So try and confine your calorie intake to an eight hour window, at least that form of calorie restriction. I'll finish there. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Kenny. This has just been very interesting, I think for, for our entire audience based on the number of questions we have flowing in. And I know I wish, and you probably wish as well, you could answer all of them, but unfortunately uh, we've run out of time today. And um, like I said, the, vi the video recording of this webinar will be available on the TCD alumni YouTube channel. So if people wanna watch back or if you wanna share this fantastic talk with your friends, please do as, because as you found, it's full of fabulous advice and very interesting information. And um, so I'd really like to say a huge thank you on behalf of the audience and from our office here at Trinity Development and Alumni uh, to Professor Kenny for all her insights. Um, I'd also like to thank those who helped uh, make this webinar possible today, particularly Deirdre O'Connor and Siobhan Brady. And last but certainly not least, of course, I'd like to thank all of you in our audience who are viewing today for sharing your questions and for engaging so actively. Now, I'm just going to share my screen here because there's a few little bits of information I'd like you to have before we go this afternoon. There we go. So we do this. This is a bi-weekly um, webinar series and our next one is going to be on Wednesday, the 30th of September at 1pm. So it's at the lunchtime slot. It's going to be on the future of startups and we'll be looking at the innovation landscape after COVID-19. And we'll, among our speakers will be Jennifer Melia, who's the head of high potential startups at Enterprise Ireland. We'll also have with us uh, Declan Weldon, who's the De Deputy Director at Trinity Research and Innovation. And we'll be welcoming Dermot O'Brien, who's the Chief Officer of Innovation and Enterprise at Trinity. So this should be really, really interesting. And if you would like to follow up on any of the things that Roseanne talked about and, and learn a little bit more about her project, Tilda, 
the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, you can do that by visiting www.tilde.ie. We'll also be sharing these links um, in the recording afterwards. Uh, Roseanne also participated in a really fabulous RTE documentary um, on science and consequences of us living longer lives. And it's called, it's done by Tile Films and it's called The End of Aging. And you can watch that through the uh, website there at the bottom of your screen. Again, we'll be sharing this live. And finally, if you'd like to get in touch with uh, the alumni office and learn more about what we do or have any questions, you can reach us at alumni at tcd.ie. As I said, our next webinar will be September 30th at 1 p.m. The registration link will be sent out by email, so just keep an eye on your inboxes. And in the meantime, uh, thank you for joining us. Take care, stay safe, make sure you talk to your friends, get your vitamin D, and uh, look after yourselves. Thanks very much.